God-centered life and uh, a God-centered life. It, 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 it I, I, you know, I don't never like um, preaching cliches. Um, that's that's not what I like. And and but but a God-centered life is 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 on purpose. It's distinct, right? And so because life has to be on purpose. You know, on, on our door, it says New Life World Ministries, live life on purpose. And so the reason why I have lived life on purpose is for the simple reason that I purposely got up and sinned every day. And so now I have to purposely get up and live a God kind of life every day. And so as I live a God kind of life, it has to be on purpose. There has, some, there has to be some, some things that become just a part of you that move into this place of godly living on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Not just when I get up, I pray, and I start my day with prayer, but, but every single moment, every aspect of life is surrounded around what does God expect, what does God think, how, what does he want me to do, how should I say this, how should I walk into this place, how should I operate in life. And so this, this God-centered life, because, because if, if I know that God's ways are perfect, that's what the scripture says, that God's ways are perfect. And if I know God's ways are perfect and I'm having multiple failures in my life, then that means if I just do start doing life God's kind of way, then I'm going to have God's kind of perfect, right? And so as I get God's kind of perfect, right, I say kind of perfect because we are imperfect people serving a perfect God, right? And so even though we're imperfect people serving a perfect God, we, we want to start, start finding some kind of perfect things going on in our lives. Because if not, all that stuff I just said the last 10 minutes will, will kind of keep showing up in our lives. And as that keeps showing up in our lives, it, it, how many people have you say, heard say, man, I tried God. I tried God and it didn't work. No, you tried church. You tried church. And there's a difference between trying church and trying God. Because you're going, trying to come to church and find perfect people, and you're never going to find perfect people in church. You're going to find imperfect people serving a perfect God. And so because of that, people that, that don't understand this, they come and look at our lives and see our infirmities and our weaknesses and our shortcomings and say, well, that's the same thing I see out there. Well, the difference between what you see out there and what you see in here is conviction. That's the difference. When, when you're out there, a lot of times you don't come across conviction because, you're, because they're numb to the things of the Holy Spirit. Where we're not numb, we just don't yield. There's a difference between being, being chastised by God and feeling it and still pushing past the chastisement and not, excuse me, and not yielding to it. And then there's a different difference between not being able to feel it at all, right? Because I can remember me doing some things in life where I didn't even think once about God, but I could do the same thing now and think about God, but it didn't stop me from doing what, what I was doing. Amen? So you're saying I got some sin in my life, right? Y'all think that? Huh? Well, I'm not having a chocolate cake issue anymore. Amen. Praise the Lord. Woo! I beat the chocolate cake demon the last couple weeks. And, and listen, listen, where's my PP at? Look, look, that, 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 see that one right there? He was persuaded by the devil this morning and put donuts on my, on my, on my desk. I'm in the gym beating myself up every week, coming home, can't walk, get out the car, back hurts, arms hurt, chest hurts, legs hurt. I'm walking around like this all week, and he going to say, Pastor, I put donuts on your donut holes. I said, man, get them out of there, man. I couldn't even walk in the room, right? I couldn't. Because, you see, 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 check this out. This is how slick the enemy is. He doesn't want to attack you when everyone is around that he can see he wants to wait with them. Don't I walked in there and the donuts would have been saying, by my, like, me and the donuts, me and the donuts in the room by themselves. They'd have said, hey, ain't nobody looking, Pastor. 
Look, look, he, they would even called me pastor. Ain't nobody looking, pastor. Yeah, yeah nobody knows. Just, just, grab, just grab one. And then that sugar gets to talking, right? And then you grab another one. And then another one. How, how, doesn't how, listen, listen, let me tell you something. Sin operates by mingling with sin, right? And so as sin operates by mingling with sin, it just produces more sin, right? And so ha, as sin intercourses with sin, it starts producing other kinds of sins. And as it produces other kinds of sins, then those sins mature and start mingling with other sins. And then all of a sudden you find yourself trapped in a sinful life where you should be living a God kind of life. And so now you don't realize what's going on because this thing appeals to your pleasure sensors. It appeals to your flesh. And so, and so because it appeals to your flesh, sometimes you got to change your palate and start having different kinds of pleasures. And these pleasures need to become spiritual. You, you have to fall in love with what God wants out of our lives in order for us to get away from the things that tantalize our flesh. Because those things that tantalize your flesh are really the, w wanting to put you in captivity. And because you become captivated, imagine a deer looking, li listen, there's a car at night coming at a deer and he's froze, captivated by the lights. Sin has captivated us knowing that it's, going, it's, it's intention is to destroy us, but we can't move away from the sin because we are captivated by the light of it, right? We are captivated by the sweetness that it, it causes our, our flesh. We're captivated by the pleasure that it produces and even though it's nothing it's something that we know we shouldn't be doing right we just go on with it but check this out the Bible says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God this is this this is that conviction I'm telling you about the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God so so check this out you don't even have to confirm that you're a child of God the Holy Spirit is confirming that, 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 that you are a child of God. And it says, the big spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. And, see, and so when the conviction comes, when the conviction comes, you got to understand, listen, there was a time where I didn't even feel bad about this. A lot of times we feel bad because of the failure, but how about just realizing and rejoicing in the fact that there was a time where I didn't even feel bad about what I was about to do. You see what I'm saying? And so now... It says, but, but see, but, but this is what it's saying, that there's some ownership by God in our lives, that we are children of God. And so that tells me that now that I'm not my own and I've been bought by God, I've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, that I've been redeemed, and that I'm a child of God, check this out. When your children misrepresent you in the street, in the world, right, how does that make you feel? A little embarrassed, right? A little embarrassed. And then you got to walk into a place and defend them, right? You got to walk into a place and defend these children because they're yours, right? So now when the spirit, bears wit spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, God is saying, listen, if you just live this God-centered life, there is some directions I've given you. There is a way that I expect you to live, but you need my grace to keep covering you. You need my miracles to keep covering you because you are disobedient. But if we would just be obedient, we would need less miracles. We would need less interference by God because we had already followed the way he was told, telling us to live. And so when God lays out this map of life, it's not because he wants to restrict us. He wants to keep us out of trouble, right? But, but a lot of times the reason why we don't get out of, stay out of trouble is just for the simple fact that we're disobedient towards God. Come on, Alex. Summer. Come on, Summer. Work with me. So God is an infinite, holy, and intelligent spirit. Under, understand this. He's infinite. Before you ever existed, he was. When you're gone, when we're gone, when y'all when gone, because I ain't going. <laughs> God is an infinite, right? He, he's alpha and omega. He, he, is, he is everything, right? See, this is the mindset I have about God. This is the mindset I have about God. 
that he's just not someone that comes around and gets me out of trouble when I need him. He's not the one who just keeps fixing my problem. He's not a wrench, right? This is God. God is an infinite, right? He, he is forever. Can you wrap your mind around that? What came first, the chicken or the egg? I, I mean, really, can you, can you really wrap your mind around infinite? We have this finite mind trying to understand this infinite being, right? And so every time we think we put God in a box and we understand who he is, God expands and he grows and he moves. The Bible says that God has manifold wisdom, right? And so, so think about taking a piece of paper and fold it down to a piece of paper that big. Once you open that paper up, you're going to see all the different folds of him. Well, God even, God even extends past all those folds. He has manifold wisdom that he cannot be contained. And so because God cannot be contained, we have to understand that we don't make God conform to our box. We conform to God's box, right? And so as God now deals with us, we move from ourselves and begin to live this God kind of life. But he's also holy and intelligent. And so this tells me that I can't slick God. I can't present myself holy and live ratchet. I, I just can't. You, you see what I'm saying? I have to present myself the way I'm supposed to be presenting myself at all times when no one else is looking. Because if he's holy, he's going to be able to identify dissimulation at any time. And being able to identify dissimulation at any time, that tells me that just because I fool you means, because listen, listen, at the end of the day, no matter what you do for me, you can't bless me the way God blesses me. You, you see what I'm saying? And so no matter what I show you in order to impress you, right? The only way I impress God is by faith. The only way to live a life of faith is to apply holiness to it. Because if I don't apply holiness to it, what good is faith? You see what I'm saying? I can believe all day, but if I don't want to do what is required that comes along with the faith, what am I going to get, right? Oh, I know it's going to happen because God, God said so, but then I live any old kind of way. Well, God already was clear about casting pearl to swine, right? And so not that we're swine, but why should we live as swine knowing that we have a holy place to live in, right? The Bible says that we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So we come out of the world and are placed in Christ Jesus, and as we're placed in Christ Jesus, we're placed in a holy place. So I told you last week, I said, when you get drunk, you get drunk with Holy Ghost, right? He's getting drunk with you. When you smoke... When you fornicate and you do all these things, you're doing them with God in you, right? Don't think just because no one else sees it that God's not affected by it. Come on, come on, come on. So my son said, let's talk. He, 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 I put this up there a few weeks ago. He said, can you truly worship God without reverence? Do you know what reverence is? Uh, let me tell you something. The reason why... Reverend is a title for a minister is because it says that the minister should be revered. He should, but some churches don't like using that because um, God should be the only one who receives reverence. So you get titles like elder, right? Like elder North carries, which, which, which I am, right? Elder, right? And so, and so can you truly worship God without reverence? So my wife says truly is the operative word, Right? Truly is the operative word. You can have what appears to be a form of worship, which is basically a performance, but without reference, there is no true, authentic worship, right? And so, and so this, when, when I read this, I was like, how true is this? How, how true is it that how can you really worship God without real reverence? Because a lot of times our worship is just for us to get a feeling and not necessarily us giving something towards God. And so a lot of times we lift up our hands in worship based on what we're going to receive in our feeler, right? Because worshiping makes us feel good. But how about living a life of worship towards God that pleases him? See, it's not necessarily about tears and jumping up and down and hands being raised and all this stuff, but a life that is always bowed towards God in reverence, a humble servant towards God that is always willing to serve him in every aspect, circumstance of life. 
And so this is what true reverence towards God is, not just Sunday morning worship, not just Sunday attendance to church, but an actual life towards God that is based on reverence toward him in every moment of our lives. And so come on, next slide. So Michael says... You can't go to church worshiping. This is the same day. Michael said this the same day. Michael, you didn't know I put this up here, did you? You can't go to church worshiping, praising God on Sunday and go back to partying on Mondays. That, that's, that's, that's Michael who said that right there. Usher Michael right there. He said that, right? <laughs> Pastor didn't say these things. But, but, but I, I, I think so. The, the feeling that you get on Sunday. What happens when the door is shut, when the church door is shut? What happens when we walk back out into the world? Only you can answer this. It, it, only you can answer what happens after I step back outside the door and I leave church and, I, and we all disperse back to our, 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 our lives, right? But let me tell you something. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're only going so far. You're still in God. And so what, hap what, what is going on in the decisions of life that cause us to choose ourselves over God? Because we choose God for salvation. Who wants to go to hell? Huh, yeah. You could be unsaved in here and, 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 and still not want to go to hell based on what you think you know about hell. Right? But, but, but for some reason, we go live as if we're going to hell knowing we're not, and take advantage of this grace of God. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And, right, and, so, and so now, in order to get to this God-centered life, there has to be some restraints that are put on. The Bible says that the love of God should constrain you, right? It should, it should cause some restraint to go on in your life. And so, and so we look at certain people as if they're stuffy, Right? Well, I don't perceive myself to be a stuffy kind of person. I like to enjoy life. I like to laugh. I like to joke, and I like to have fun. But there's just certain things I would not do. I was doing the dishes uh, two days ago, right? Doing the dishes, and I'm thinking about the bills that are coming up, right? And I said, man, if I would have just saved some of that money from back in the day, I wouldn't have to worry about this, right? And then I said, hmm. Maybe two months out there, I'd be all right right now. I, I mean, this is just my mind. God forbid. How would I ever, how, how could I ever taste the Lord and see that he is good and go back to a life that caused me to go to jail once, twice, three times, caused me to get shot, caused me to have drug problems and, drug, and, and relationship issues, caused me not to be the father that I'm supposed to be, right? And so I'd rather sleep on park bench then it would be to sleep in jail cell again, right? And so I'd rather go without and have everything in God and go without anything in this world and lose every single thing I had in order not to sacrifice my relation. Let nothing separate you from the love of God. And so as these thoughts, see, listen, see, listen, some preachers might not be willing to tell you about their thought life, but the reason why I tell you about my thought life is because I want you to know that these same thoughts come up in my life. Right? And so how could I stand in here for the last 13 years worshiping God and then allow a thought to move me out of the will of God? There's no way that I can let a thought from the past move me out of the will of God and cause so much trauma because as soon as that thought comes into hand as a seed and I plant it into the earth, I have something that comes along with that. He who sows corruption will reap corruption, right? And he who sows life will reap it in joy, right? And so now we got to realize that what we do on Monday when the door shut has repercussions that come along with it. Check this out. It could be good things that come along with it. Or it could be bad things that come along with it. But it's all based on your decisions. Some of us just need to make a difference in our decisions. I'm not questioning your love for God at all. I'm talking about your decisions. Come on, next slide. Come on. So God is a spirit. God is a whole infinite, holy 
intelligent spirit, right? And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, right? And so this tells me that my worship has to be in spirit and according to the truth, right? Some of us make our own truths with God instead of living the truth that's been displayed. It's quiet in here today, boy, y'all. This thing's tight. Is it tight? Some of y'all sleep, though. Some of y'all sleep. Y'all lucky I ain't my pastor, because my pastor said, you get the napping, I get the slapping. Come on, come on, come on. Work with me. Y'all want to go on vacation, too? Is that what it is? Y'all sleepy. God is a spirit. The mode of life must correspond to the object of life. So, so check this out. The mode of life, my, my method of operations, right, how I operate, the mode of life must correspond to the object of life. Who gave us life? God, right? He set Adam and Eve in, in, in the earth, and, he, and procreation was set in motion. And as procre- Because we, we would love to say that God created me personally, right? No, he created Adam and Eve. And then he set procreation in the earth, and as procreation, now he knew us in the womb, but he didn't form us like he formed Adam. He didn't take another woman's rib like he did Adam's rib, I mean, another man's rib like he did Adam's rib and and made my wife, right? He just says, now that man and woman's in the earth, procreation goes forth. And so as procreation goes forth, he allows us to exist. Knowing in our fore, his foreknowledge that we would exist, he says now this mode of life must core. See, if you go this deep into understanding who God is to you, that he knew you would exist, that he put procreation in existence, that if it was not for him breathing the breath of life into man, man would never exist. And so because of this, he put us in his mind over 2,000 years ago before the foundation of the world, matter of fact, he put us in mind and that now that we exist, how can I live any other way now that he has revealed himself to me? How many times before your relationship with Christ, how many times before your relationship with God did you pray and say, please God help me? Please God fix this issue. How many times have you called out to him and he's fixed it? And then, and then when, when he asks us, he doesn't demand, he just asks us to live a certain way, we refuse it. Right? It says, hence, it has now become the law of life for all worshipers. See, see, he says, those who worship me in spirit and in truth, not just those who lift their hands up, but those who worship me will understand that this is a law of life. This is something I can't get out of. Right? And so... That they must worship God in spirit truth. Every other sort of living is thereby done away as well as in proportion as the provisional system of religion. Ooh. So that tells me, check this out. It's not necessarily what church says, it's what the word says. Because we have some modes of doing church that are not biblical, Right? And so because they're not biblical, because they're not biblical, and as well as in proportion, wait a minute, hold on, every other sort of living is thereby done away. Listen, listen, whoever you are, get rid of it. Whoever you are, who has identified a shortcoming in their life that is not like God, that repeats itself constantly? You have no, uh, oh. <laughs> Don't make me tell it. Shoo. Huh? Don't, don't, you're trying to sit there all cute. <laughs> the mode is living t- is to be conformed to the move of the spirit. God is the living spirit, as pure spirit is present to his worshipers. Come on, next slide. God is pure spirit, absolute spirit, in opposition to all materialistic and materializing conceptions. Listen to this. God is pure spirit, 
absolute spirit in opposition to all materialistic and materializing conceptions. This clear, clearly implies that the anthropomorphic, so anthropomorphic is, is, is like when a devil, I mean, nah, an angel takes human form, right? right? Anthropomorphic expressions of the Bible must not be taken literally. Okay, so this is clearly implies that the anthropomorphic expression of the Bible must not be taken literally. Terzaluna described a God a body, but perhaps he meant it in the sense of substance. So when he when it says that 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 God has hands, fingers, toes, the smell of God, the, the 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 prayer goes up into God's nostrils, he's saying that this is symbolic, right? Not that angels don't take human form, but this is a tribute to God. Right. And so what it's saying is, is that God is a spirit and nothing else. And so as we see this old man sitting in the sky with a clock, you got a you got you got a wrong conception. God is everywhere in all times and all things. He is God. I can remember when I first came to Christ and I and, 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 and I was dreaming one night and I was in this black void and it was like where me and Michael was. And it was like I floated towards towards Christ. Right. I floated. You ain't got to move, Mike. Stay right there. I floated towards him, right? And when I got up to him, I asked him, I said, how can you be everywhere at all times, right? And he said, like this, and he lifted his robe up, and I'm in this black void, and all of a sudden, all this light shined in the room, and I woke straight up, right? God, God, God cannot be hindered by anything, right? And so to attribute a body to God would hinder him, right? And that's why he gave us Christ Jesus for so we can have an image of who he is. Come on, next slide, next slide. But God, God is a spirit, the transcendental, immaterial, rational existence that constitutes the essence of supernatural entities such as God, angels, and human forms. Listen, listen, every aspect that you have of God transcends that thought. You cannot contain God in your thought life. So because we cannot contain God in our thought life, why not just worship and live in a manner that shows reverence towards him no matter what it is in life? Who is willing to make some definite sacrifices to banish some things, some attitudes, some ideologies, some philosophies in order to live a better way of life? You got to listen. Listen, let me tell you something. If you, I've said it three weeks ago, some of you will walk out of this building and not change one thing after listening to a sermon that causes, that, that, that calls for change. And so a lot of times we are so caught up in ourselves that we refuse to allow God to interrupt and interfere in our lives in order for us to become better people. You see what I'm saying? There, there had to be something Listen, I was, I was a drug dealer. Imagine, l- listen, listen, think about the mindset of a drug dealer. Think, just think about it. Some of us in this room know the mindset, right? I was a drug dealer. Just take that one aspect. Now I'm, I'm also a drug user, right? Now take that aspect. Now I'm a liar. I'm a cheat. Baby, you want to add some more? You got 25 years with me. You, you, you know, Nell, you want to add any? You know me all my life. Y'all, do you want to add any? What am I missing? At the core of who I am, there's a good person. There's this person that wants to live and doesn't know how to live. I'm introduced to Christ Jesus as an adult, right? Not, I'm not talking about my introduction of my mom dragging me to church, my grandfather dragging me to church. I'm talking about at 33 years old, I'm introduced to Christ. Now, I have a decision to make. Do I go on with my mind or do I go on with the mind of Christ? I wholeheartedly, it got on my wife's nerves that I served Christ so hard at the beginning because I went from one distinct way of living to a completely other di- way of living. Everything that she ever wanted from me and, and the potential that she thought I had, I started to produce. But because she was used to seeing me one way, she, she said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're going too fast. And the reason why I was going too fast is because I saw something in God that was for me. And so because I saw something in God that was for me, I began to chase after it. 
And so, and so we get glimpse of what God wants for our lives. We understand it, but because it moves us out of our comfort zones, because it moves us away from who we define ourselves as, we refuse to move. And as we refuse to move, we start being stagnated and not understanding why our prayers are not working. Because when, because the Bible tells me when you pray, believe that you receive. And so you, when you say, God, I just want to live for you. I just want to choose you. I just want more of you, God. But then you get up and go do what you used to do. Then that's not saying that you received it. When you receive it, it's not when you feel it. It's receiving it when you expect it, right? And so as I expect expect a new life, I began to live a new life. And so as you expect a new life, as you expect certain things from God, you got to get up from prayer and live this way. Because what you're waiting for is a pie in the sky, God to say abracadabra, and you're changed, and it does not work that way. You have to move on what you pray for. Amen? Amen. Come on, I'm about to let y'all go. Come on. Next slide. Next slide. So when, 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 when God breathed life into man, I want you to see what you got. This is called neshama, breath, living being, movement of the air. Flesh is not a part of this worship. So check this out. The Bible says that God breathed into man and he became another living soul, right? Listen, when Adam sinned, we got separated from God. Christ dies. When Christ dies and resurrects, he brings right relationship back with God. Now our spirits and our souls have been quickened by God. Now we really get to understand what this life of God is. We had living, moving parts, but we were moving as dead men and women. Now, 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 this breath of life that has been in us dormant all this time has been awakened in us and is now conflicting with the life that we used to have. The life of God that had been dormant because in Ephesians says that in times past you used to live a certain way but you've been quickened by the Spirit of God. And so now that you've been quickened by the Spirit of God, this, this spirit man in you has become alive and as the spirit man in li- it comes alive, it begins to fight against this other person that is inside of you. It begins to fight against this other other way of thinking. It begins to deal with you. And so a lot of times we are in there battling with ourselves and the reason, and listen, it's you. It's you fighting against you. You think the devil's attacking you and it's not it. It is you fighting you. How many times have you got up and planned to do good and found yourself doing bad? Paul said, whenever I do good, evil is always present with me. And the reason why is, is because our three-dimensional bodies are still caught in a world of sin, but we are blessed by our soul, in our souls, and so our souls are b- fighting what we receive from the outside, and there's this war going on in our, in our minds and in our hearts and our intellects and our imaginations, and we're trying to figure out how to live, and if we would just do it God's way, all the figuring would go out the door. It's this, it's, this, it's this life source. Listen to me, y'all. It's this life source that has been harnessed in us. This infinite being has chose to rest on the inside of you and has made you infinite, holy, intelligent beings. Me and my wife was riding in the car the other day, yesterday, and I said, baby, we haven't accomplished some of the things that some of the other people in our lives have accomplished. I said, but the gospel evens the playing field. She said, yes, that's what she said. Yes, it does. The gospel, listen, the gospel will bring somebody high down and it'll bring somebody low up because we all humble ourselves under God. And so, and so, and so when Kenyatta was up here ministering and he was talking about how uh, uh, we, are, we, we attribute blessings to someone who has a whole lot. But let me tell you something. If they trust in their riches and not in God, guess what they're going to get? Nothing. Because a rich man without love of his family, a rich man without good health, is a, is a, a man with a lot of money who is poor in health. But a man who has, has everything in his hands but no finances, he, he's a poor man with no finances. But what the gospel does, if we just do it God's way, let me tell you something. 
See, see, let, let me talk about this real quick. The body of Christ has never lacked finances. The body of Christ lacks togetherness and obedience. And so because one body of, of believers looks like they don't have as much as the other ones, it's because, because the Bible says to those who are rich, make sure you take care of others. So what happens is when you take a whole bunch of rich people and put them in one ministry and they don't do what they're supposed to do to the others. See, listen, in Acts, the Bible says that all things were common, that everyone put everything together to make sure that the body of Christ was strong and just not the finger, just not the toe of the, bo of the body was strong. Yes. And so we don't lack uh, resources. We lack togetherness and obedience. And so, and so if we would just be obedient, obedient to what God told us to do. See, we always wait for someone else to be obedient, and then we become obedient, right? Or we get in on their obedience. But let me tell you something. How do you change the world? In the mirror. That's how you change the world. The world is changed. Just the man in the mirror. Oh, yeah. Did you take a picture of that? Oh, my God. <laughs> Come on, next slide. Last slide. Next slide. Oh, no, no, stay there. And man became a living soul. Haya, possessing life, a living thing. Next, next slide. See, see I, I get off on this kind. This is what I like. I, this is how I study. So this nephis, life, People, throat, soul, breath, neck, living being, personality, dead soul to feel the soul, appetite, passion, emotion, peril life, right? So man became another living soul, right? So check this out. So check this out. Personality to feel the soul, appetite, passion, emotion, perils of life. What, what, what is the inner you thirsting for? You see what I'm saying? Because a lot of times what we, what we have passion for is something other than God. And so what I found out is that I take every passion that I have and I filter it through God. As I filter it through God, it has to produce. But if I keep my passions and appetites outside of God, check this out. Now I take parts of my life and keep them away from Christ. And anything that Jamal keeps away from Christ will happen to have sin infiltrated. You see what I'm saying? And so as sin begins to infiltrate these aspects of life, now I'm trying to wonder why this isn't working because, and the only reason was, is, is, is because I didn't put it with the right plate, right? I didn't, I didn't put it with the right set of things. And so now my personality, my soul, everything that I breathe for, in him I live, and in him I breathe, and in him I have my very being. There is no Jamal without God. There, there just isn't. Jamal does not exist outside of God. I have friends that, that call me up and say, yo, I don't want to talk to the pastor. I want to talk to my friend. Well, your friend is dead. You got a new friend here, but the one that you're looking for is dead. And so I don't know how, but, well, I don't want the Bible's answer. I want Jamal's answer. I said, well, I want to tell you something. All my answers come from the Bible now. I don't have old answers to give you. I only have this way to give you. If this is not what you want, I might be the wrong person you're talking to. Because my, I, listen, listen, as a deer panteth after water, I thirst after you, O oh God. He who hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. So check this out. You know what that tells me? Everything that's put on my plate is not necessarily for me to consume. Every situation that presents itself that might seem right, right? There's a way that seemeth right unto man. There's a way that seems right unto man. Everything that is presented to me is not necessarily for me. Some of those things are presented to pull me away, right? And so, and so as I step outside of the will of God, I step into trouble. And the reason why I step into trouble is because I've stepped out of what God has placed on my plate. But check this out. I have such a great relationship with myself. I have such a great inner relationship with myself that is, as soon as I take the step outside of the will of God, I can feel where God's release is in my life. I can feel where he says, son, I'm not there. 
You're going to have to make a choice to go on without me in this or with me and wait on me. He who waits on the Lord shall renew his strength. You see what I'm saying? And so, and so now, sometimes you got to wait for God's yes. And so, and so you're asking God for something, and he's telling you no or to wait. And do you have enough patience to allow God to fix this thing up for you so when you step into it, you step into it with the blessing of the Lord or you step into it with the strenuous things of life? You're going to have to make a choice whether I have an appetite towards God and God only and everything is tied to him or I'm going to start doing things my way. And as I do things my way, I'm going to get what I get because it's not with God. Amen. Come on, give God praise.